Okay, so we'll go ahead and start. And um, next session is going to be the Tara Puja. This session, I'm going to go through the 21 Taras. I, I thought that maybe it would be nice to do the 21 Taras first, so that then when we do the Puja, we have a particular kind of uh, flavor of each of them, and that we feel um, a strong connection with each of them. So that's the hope. And um, the 21 Taras, this is going to be a very quick presentation of them because you can go into tons of depth with each one. Each one has their special emphasis, but uh, hopefully it's interesting and it can help you go more deeply with the practice. So um, go ahead and set our motivation. <laughs> Drolla penche sange drupa shol sange churon soge churon la jan chupadu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki drolla penche sange drupa shol sange churon soge churon la jan chupadu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki so possibly the first question is, what is the difference between a sadhana and a puja? <laughs> okay, so a sadhana is going to be the practice manual to help support you coming closer to the deity, closer to becoming the deity, and more in resonance with the deity in your daily life. And there's going to be offerings within the course of a sadhana, sometimes once, sometimes twice, sometimes throughout. But the main emphasis isn't the offerings. The main emphasis is going to be refuge bodhicitta and the self-generation practice and the mantra recitation time. So sadhanas are going to be more heavily on mantra recitation for the most part. And pujas are more likely to be done in an assembly, in a group. They're more likely to emphasize the offering part of the practice and the prayer part of the practice. So pujas are going to be a lot more verbal, a lot more chanting, a lot less silent meditation, a lot less mantra. The emphasis of pujas is to gather merit. Yeah, you really want to be gathering merit and clearing obstacles with all forms of pujas. And doing it together in an assembly with lots of people, the more people, the more minds, the more minds, the more power. So you might have found this to be ca the case where sometimes it's nice to meditate in your room by yourself. But sometimes, despite the distractions of other people and their breathing and their ways and their, you know, personalities, that actually, despite the fact that human beings are sometimes aggravating, it can be easier to practice in a room with them silently together or reciting together. It actually can make your concentration sharper being around them. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this, but we know that we create an atmosphere around ourselves based on what we're thinking. You know, you know it very directly when someone is very comfortable, relaxed, and likes you, sitting next to them is very easy. Someone who's feeling very awkward, who's feeling very self-conscious, who is maybe irritable, sitting next to them can feel a little bit like there's static electricity between you, or it's kind of edgy, or you feel kind of like you need more space. Yeah, you can almost feel the personal space that people emit if you're tuning into it. When people are angry, that's the obvious one. You can feel it when people are angry before they even start to speak. It's just like a wave of rage precedes them. But most significantly is when we're with the lamas, you almost feel their bodhicitta. Yeah, it's almost like your heart opens in response to the fact that their heart is always open. Now, this isn't always, this isn't in every case, and it doesn't have to mean anything about the side of the person. It can be completely your own projection. It's very hard to know what is your own projection and what is coming from the side of the person. But you know that there's something going on in interaction that is more than verbal, that is more than body language. So if you're all sitting together focusing on a similar thing, it's gonna have a supportive effect and the merit created is gonna be more. So pujas are best done together, not to say that you can't do them on your own, 
sadanas are often done alone, but that's not to say they can't be done together. Does that make sense, the difference between sadanas and pujas? Yeah, I, I have a pretty important question that I want to kind of run by you before we get started today. And thank you for that description. That was really helpful because I have never actually been to a, like a place of worship. I've been seeking a sangha for a very long time now. Um, and I'm really grateful to have found you guys. And I think there's a lot to be said about not having a sangha right away. And that I had to really practice patience and really test the Dharma as it came up in my life. I didn't have anybody else I could turn to for support or help. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For what sure. If, um, it's gonna help what, you not take them for granted when you finally meet them. <laughs> what if we accidentally step into Buddhahood? Like we like I didn't know. <laughs> it's, it's, you're gonna know. You're gonna know, and it's not gonna be accidental. You might okay. have a really good day of friendliness, but that's not enlightenment, right? Or a really good day of amazing concentration, but that's not Buddhahood. Um, let's let's kind of you know unpack the fact that we use the word enlightened very colloquially in daily life. You know, that's an enlightened way of being. Uh, you're so enlightened. This is enlightening. That's colloquial. In terms of the technical definition of enlightenment, you're free of all obscurations, both cognitive and afflictive, meaning there is nothing that prevents your knowledge. Nothing prevents your knowledge of everything. And then also there is nothing that is disturbing your mind in any way, ever. So you're abiding in continuous happiness, uncontaminated bliss, free from attachment, continuous happiness. And there is no effort needed to act for the welfare of sentient beings. It's spontaneous, it's effortless, and it's correct. And the only thing preventing you kind of lifting everyone out of suffering is their own karmic obscurations, not your abilities. So it's something that is going to take a great deal of purification of the mind to get rid of the negative habits and the seeds of those, the suffering from those. It's going to take a while. And then we're going to need to accumulate a lot of mental momentum or merit, positive karma, positive um, kind of corrective behaviors, but also opening and developing behaviors like compassion and loving kindness so that they become so, I guess, so integrated and so connected with us that you don't have to stop and think for them to arise all of your mental states are just imbued with them continuously. Yeah, like water into water. So those two projects, accumulation of merit and purification of negative karma will lead to Buddhahood eventually. But effort is required in both cases for sure. And so it's not gonna be accidental. Um, but also it's not like we've just started You've entered spiritual paths many, many lives, picked them up, had some fun, got used to it, got distracted, put them down, did something else, picked them up again, tried something else, put it down. You know, it's not like we're um, totally fresh little babies on the path, even if we are fresh little babies in the Dharma this life. So, you know, also have some conviction that wisdom and compassion have been developed in your mind stream already. It's just, we need a bit more now. And the, the community can't be underestimated, even if it's a virtual community. And the Sangha Jewel, you know, there's levels, right? There's just the community itself. There's monks and nuns in general. And then there are people who are ordained or otherwise who have achieved an Arya path, who have achieved the path of seeing. And those are the ultimate Sangha Jewel. But at whatever level, you need people around you who can bear witness to your suffering. And details and nuance and strategies and tools will come along the way and clarify along the way. And really, Tara practice is the perfect thing for what you're describing, because it's got that combination of both action and protection. It's got the combination of healing and warmth and nurturing, as well as power and confidence. So the, the combination of the qualities in the tar practice, it, it is a good timing. It's a good one that you've come across. Not like, you know, the others wouldn't do, they do just fine, but it does sound like auspicious timing. So more Tara and then we'll take 
the intellectual understandings and we'll take the practice connections and we'll take it all and wrap it up into the Tara Puja in the next session and kind of bring it all together. Just to clarify, the source of Tara practices are from the Buddha himself. Yeah, Shakyamuni Buddha taught Tantra. And um, these particular practices can be found in the Arya Tara root Tantra, which is also called the 108 names of Tara Sutra. So there is some confusion sometimes amongst the different Buddhist schools. Is Tantra real Buddhism or is it some Tibetan hybrid? And it is real Buddhism really taught by Shakyamuni Buddha as a strategy for students of certain dispositions. And it's the quick path, it's a hard path, but it's also very blissful. And you need a type of mental stability to engage with it that might not be your immediate ability. You might need to grow into it. But just some context there. This monthly four mandala offering to Chittamani Tara that we do at a lot of Dharma centers, the praises to the 21 Taras are recited and are related to all classes of Tantra and all versions of Tara and are particularly powerful for dispelling obstacles, both inner and outer. It's usually practiced on the new moon day of the month. Tara Puja at Dharma centers is kind of a common thing in pretty much all Tibetan Buddhist centers. And if your own home Tibetan Buddhist center isn't doing it, um, ask them because it's probably just fallen off the schedule. It's a very popular, very important one to do. It's very good to do right now during the pandemic because one of the benefits of Tara is dispelling plague and dispelling illness. And so, um, you know, when, if you know that someone has COVID, for example, my, I just found out my own teacher has COVID and he's in his eighties and that's a little bit scary. And so all of us are just doing more Tara practice. You know, it's just kind of like, oh, right. Chronic illness or um, epic disaster plague or cancer or okay. Yep. Tara. Of course, Medicine Buddha is very useful for illness as well, but when you need swift action for something that could be ended, you know, chronic illness and Tara go together fine, but even better is if it's something that could kill you, but could end, you know, like, I don't know, I got bit by a tick the other day and I was like, oh no, Lyme disease. So Tara, Tara, Tara and antibiotics, right? Both. (laughs) <laughs> right? Tara and antibiotics, right? And so similarly, COVID, you think, okay, Tara, 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 and wash my hands and wear a mask and get the vaccine. Together, <laughs> probably you're going to be fine. But there's so many variables and so many conditions, we can't really know all of them. So with all of these practices, we think the practice itself is a powerful condition to awaken our previously created positive karma. But if we haven't created the cause for the specific remedy that we need, it's not like we can force it. So Tara is activating what we have and we're creating new positive karma through engagement with her. So it's kind of like we're tapping into the past and creating something for the future during our present moment practice. Yeah. And this is the thing about karma is to understand the lag time a little bit. So say you're feeling really um, anxious, you have a negative karmic seed ripening as anxiety, and then you do some prayers to Tara and some mantras, it's, it might not work the first three minutes. But if you kind of uh, keep going, that practice is watering your previous seeds of positive karma, and will bring in soothing and relief eventually. But those seeds have to be nurtured and grown. So there's lag time. Yeah. And then you'll think um, either Tara doesn't work or it takes a while to kick in. But actually what's happening is it takes a minute for old karma to ripen as happiness. Right now you're finishing a seed of suffering. Once the seed has been watered, it kind of needs to play out. Make sense. And so then while you're doing these practices, you're also planting seeds for the future, for future happiness, for future health, for future well being, for future positive connection with whoever you're praying for. So that's a good side as well. So anyone that you're doing practice for, you become a powerful condition for them, which is why, you know, you might think, why do I need to do practices for people? Why can't I just um, get someone else to do it for me? 
that can work if it's very direct and you're the direct benefactor. But if it's kind of like there are already Buddhas out there working for sentient beings, why do I need to be a Buddha to work for sentient beings? That's where you need to look more closely at karma and realize your connection with people is part of why you're a stronger condition for them. So if you say a Dharma phrase to your good friend, it might sink in differently than if the best Dharma teacher in the world who was fully enlightened said it because of the connection you have with each other. Does that make sense? So in terms of prayers and practices, what we're doing is we're using our strong karmic connection with people plus our strong karmic connection with the deity and the deity's power of practice all together to be a powerful condition to help assist either ourself or others or both like that. So Tara's already benefiting sentient beings before we ask her to. We already have a karmic connection with people before we're using it particularly with any specificity, but now we're bringing all those things together and there is more power and more intention, therefore more potential for positive effect. Tara particularly can have that quickness you know, yeah. some of the other practices, they, they have a good long-term effect, but it takes a while for them to kind of kick in. And Tara has that extra element of speed. There was um, some very terrible fires in Australia a couple of years ago. You know, it got, I got overshadowed by the pandemic, but it was a big deal. Do you remember? And, um, and I had some friends in Australia at the time who were doing a lot of Tara practice and the fire was coming towards them and it actually split and went around. And it's one of those things where it's like, maybe there's a science reason we can find why that happened, but it's kind of weird. And it, it, you know, it happened in a couple cases where people were doing really, really strong practice and did fire safety measures, right? Worldly conditions and practice conditions, but the fire was coming and then it just split and went around and you think, wow, thank you, Tara, <laughs> you know? So it's a combination of things coming together. And my own teacher is always saying this. He's saying, don't neglect worldly strategies. It's just you can give more power to worldly strategies by bringing Dharma to them. You know, if you've got a terrible headache, you can do Tara practice and it might help. Or you can take aspirin and do Tara practice and it might really help. And just the aspirin without the Tara might have some effect. Just the Tara without the aspirin might have some effect. But together, lots of effects. You see? But, you know, it, it can be the case where you don't have a karmic connection with the manufacturers of a pill or the ingredients of a pill. And so, well, it works for your friend. It doesn't work for you. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with the substance. It means you don't have a karmic connection with that strategy or with that substance. So karma is incredibly nuanced and incredibly elaborate. Is it disrespectful to chant a mantra while you're lying in bed in the evening? Depends on your motivation. Yeah, it depends on your motivation. Yeah, but, but motivation I can't think about Tara. That's okay. I mean, what I'm saying is that I'm what I'm saying is that it's not about being in bed. It's about your motivation. So if your motivation for doing Tara practice in bed is, um, I don't care, this doesn't matter. I'm just going to do this here because it's comfortable. That's a little bit rude. What exactly is Tara practice? That you know, meaning is it just a you know, meaning mantra or whatever? You can address this in the end or talk about it now briefly. I mean, we're just talking generally Tara practices, any meditation or thought process related to Tara, the Buddha of action and protection. Yeah, Okay. And it is also chanting the mantra. Yeah, there are many variations. So that's the large category is Tara practice. Then there's, you know, Tara mantra, Tara puja, the Tara. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. 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 So it's the large category. That's fine. Thank you. I understand. Sure. Sure. So when in doubt, motivation is the main thing. Okay. <clears throat> and that's something for us always to remember. Um, here's just a note because we're about to do the Tara Puja in the next session. During this monthly four mandala offering to Chittamani Tara, those without the empowerment refrain from what is called the self generation section and the blessing of the offerings, inner, outer, and Torma. And this is all going to be very obviously signposted within the um, practice itself. And you also don't use mudras or the dorje or the bell for those without the empowerment. Um, Aside from that, the puja can be done by anyone. 
So this is really only about two pages of many pages of practice. But just so you know, self-empowerment and blessing the offering is only for those with the empowerment. So this practice was brought to Tibet by Lama Atisha. Some of you will remember Lama Atisha from Lamp of the Path fame, our first kind of official Lam Rim practice that came into the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And um, it was popularized very quickly. It resonated with the Tibetans very quickly. So this practice has been kind of the heart of Tibetan Buddhist practice for, you know, a thousand years easily. Um, the first Dalai Lama, Gendon Drup, wrote the commonly used sadhanas, the practice manuals for Tara. Um, the version of the praise we use is a translation by Panglo Chempo. So we, despite it coming from Shakyamuni Buddha, and then being transmitted in various places all over the world. In the Tibetan tradition, we really heavily rely on um, Lama Yeshi, or excuse me, Lama Atisha and the first Dalai Lama. Their kind of transmission of it, their practice of it, that's really um, the source and the context for what we use today. When you see this picture of the 21 Taras, um, just to know how it goes, this is the order of the praises and the order of the Taras. So it starts down here with this red Tara, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So it kind of goes around like that. So when you're looking at the image and you're doing Tara praises, that's, that's the order of the praises and the order of the Taras. It's just helpful to know that those aren't just kind of randomly plugged in there, that the order is um, actually quite linear. So um, we'll go through the 21 emanations and I'll be using this particular commentary as the basis, this one from Lama Lundrup. And he was the abbot of Kopan Monastery in Nepal for many years. That's one of our kind of heart monasteries in the FPMT. So we start with homage to Tara Tara, regular Tara. And it says, Om homage to the Venerable Tara, the first syllable Om you know. It's made up of three parts, A, U, Ma, Om, right? A, U, Ma comes together for Om. And these three elements make up the syllable Om. They represent the holy body, holy speech, and holy mind of the object of one's prostration, in this case, Tara. Jetsun in Tibetan means like perfect pure, Jay refers to the fact that she is the supreme mother of all the Buddhas. Sun is usually translated as venerable or noble. She's the noble one because she possesses the three classes of vows. The individual liberation vows, which are called pratamoksha vows, the bodhisattva vows, and the tantric vows. So noble one in this context means holder of vows. She's an Arya or superior being because she does not abide in the extremes of samsara or nirvana. That means she's free from both the extremes of cyclic existence and the extreme of nirvana, which is also called the extreme of peace. Therefore, she's called an Arya. So sometimes this is translated as, oh, my prostrate to the noble transcendent liberator. So Chatzel refers to getting rid of all the faults in one's mental continuum. And cell refers to beseeching her to bestow realizations upon oneself. So when we do these kind of homages and these pleas and these, you know, you know, please listen to me, please help me, please support me. What we're really doing is like throwing a rope and she um, is catching it. But really, it's the other way around. She's been throwing the rope the whole time. And right now we're finally deciding to catch it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's something called an aspirational prayer, which is kind of a linking karma between what it is that you want and the karma that you have. To link those two together, we use aspirational prayers. Most commonly, we talk about it at the time of death. Okay. So at the time of death, you want your best karma to ripen for your rebirth, right? So how do you get your best karma to ripen for your next rebirth? An aspirational prayer, which is watering the specific seeds for the specific conditions you want to continue your path in the next life. So, you know, it doesn't have to be formal. It can just be, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. May I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Water, water, water. Good projecting karma. Done. 
or just Tara, <laughs> support me. Just Tara, support me. Waters those seeds. So you're not um, trying to inject yourself with a whole bunch of new karmic seeds at the last minute. You're relying on the fact that you've already lived a good life with lots of virtue, lots of generosity, lots of kindness. And those are the seeds that you want to awaken for your next rebirth. You don't want all the times you were angry and miserly and full of grumps and all that kind of stuff. And what would water those would be anger. If you die with an angry mind, then you're watering those negative seeds and you're going to have a negative rebirth, right? So it's the aspirational prayers are the kind of the mechanism by which we link old karma to the goal that we want. Does it make sense? So Tara praises are linking, but they're also creating new seeds as well. So that first Tara, we're kind of launching the whole system and then we go through them one by one. And you can think of these 21 Taras as all emanations of the same Tara specific versions to suit specific needs. Or you can think of them as 21 individuals who were once regular people just like us who developed their minds and became specifically energized for these purposes. Either way is fine. There's a lot of interesting commentaries about these. Those two free ones I mentioned are really excellent. But when you're looking at these 21 Taras, what you can do is just imagine that as you say the praises, that streams of green light are flowing to you from them, blessing your body, speech, and mind with the particular support of that particular Tara. And it's all well, well and good to say, please support all my positive endeavors. Please help end all of my suffering. Done. <laughs> right? But sometimes when we get specific, it helps our own mind get more specific about what do we need. Now, what do we actually need? Do we need some support for our mental well-being? Or is our body actually got a lot of aches and pains lately and it's been very distracting? Or what do we really need right now? And sometimes directing to the different Taras, you'll kind of resonate with a few of them really strongly. And the rest of them, you're like, yep, yay. But some of them, you're like, oh, yeah, I need that. <laughs> and it can actually help invite the support for those things. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go through them. Okay, so first one is Tara, the swift heroine. Swift heroine, and she's red, and she's holding this vase. <clears throat> Here, swift is used because her enlightened activities in benefiting sentient beings are faster and quicker than all other Buddhas. Therefore, she is known as the swift heroine. Heroine means she destroys the host of Maras without leaving any behind whose eyes are like an instant flash of lightning. The eyes here refer to the wisdom eyes. Her wisdom eyes are likened to the instant flash of lightning. They are fast and quick as lightning because she sees each and every object of knowledge in an instant, i.e. she comprehends all phenomena instantly. Therefore, her eyes are like the instant flash of lightning. Then we have Tara, white as autumn moon. And this is not white Tara, but is a white Tara for kind of longevity and increase of merit, lifespan, those things. And the autumn moon is very white, beautiful, and round, like the full moon that is not obscured by clouds. Furthermore, the brilliance of her holy face is not just like one moon, but like 100 of such beautiful, perfect moons. Her holy face is as bright as if it were blazing with the expanding light of a thousand stars assembled together. Tara possesses this kind of brilliance and splendor. Anyone who looks at Tara with her beautiful body will agree that she is splendid and brilliant. Her aspect is peaceful and calming. Just by thinking of these aspects of Tara and looking at her, all negative emotions such as attachment and anger in our mind will be pacified naturally. When we can practice in this way, we will get the benefits of increasing our lifespan and our merit, purifying our negative karma and obscurations and so forth. So, you know, this sounds like, you know, some pretty big advertising, right? Just by looking at her, you'll feel all better. But I think there is something to that and you can relate it to your life where if there is someone in your life who is consistently kind to you, who is consistently supportive of you, just by seeing their face, you relax. 
Yeah, they, they did studies, I think, what was it, on uh, Mother Teresa's face and people looking at her face, their blood pressure would go down. And whether she's a regular person with all sorts of faults and whether she's a saint or whatever, whatever she is, people's association with her face made them relax. Yeah, and so our association with the face of Tara, and, you know, she's supposed to be sort of like 16 years old in the prime of youth, radiating vitality. You know, that kind of vitality you have when you're 16 and you're kind of like in, you're almost like immortal feeling and you feel sort of indestructible, that kind of like height of youth and power, that kind of vibrant vitality, but then such a peaceful, peaceful, pleasant face. It's not about conventional beauty. Yeah, although there is conventional beauty by whatever standard. And of course, if you see art, artists' representations, Tara is going to look a million different ways, depending on the artist's idea of what is beauty. But what we're talking about are the qualities that we associate with peace and the qualities we associate with calm and protection. So just by seeing her face, you're relaxed. And so just kind of take those references you have from your own life of the relief your nervous system feels when you see a dear friend who you don't have to be standing on any ceremony with, who you don't have to have your guard up with, someone you can really let down your hair with, that deep peace you feel with a heart friend, that it'll be even deeper than with Tara. And then golden Tara, giver of supreme virtue, this particular Tara's holy body is golden in color with a slight bluish hue. Her body is likened to the gold of the river Zambu that is said to be very clear, refined, and pleasant to look at. So now we refer to the causes that bring about the attainment of the state of Tara or Tarahood. The causes are practicing the six perfections mentioned in the praise, giving joyous effort, which we can sometimes translate as perseverance, asceticism or the practice of morality, ethics, wisdom, patience, and concentration. And Tara, before she was Tara, trained in these six perfections over a very long period of time. She perfected them and attained enlightenment, meaning she had perfect bodhicitta. She became enlightened through the practice that involved the union of both method, things like compassion, bodhicitta, etc., and wisdom the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence, knowledge of reality. And so this one is also goldish, victorious golden Tara, Ushnisha. And Ushnisha is like this crown pinnacle up here. And Tara, the victorious crown pinnacle of the Buddhas, because she is the mother of the victorious ones, meaning those who have become enlightened. And this Tara abides in the manner of being completely victorious, over all disharmonious or unfavorable conditions and all opposing forces. This Tara also abides in the manner of having abandoned the two obscurations, the afflictions and their imprints. So the two obscurations being afflictive obscurations and cognitive obscurations, the afflictive obscurations being those things that limit our ability to have loving kindness and compassion because we have this default of ignorance, of anger, of jealousy, of pride. We remove those obscurations and then their imprints. These are like obscurations to knowledge or obscurations to omniscience. So we've gotten our minds settled down, but still we have the habit of seeing things in a certain way. We have a habit of seeing inherent existence even though gradually on the path we stop believing it, things still appear that way and that blocks our ability to see reality. So she's removed both of these, which means she's completely omniscient. And then Tara proclaiming whom, the syllable whom, which is the physical form of the realization of compassion and wisdom in her holy mind is at her heart. She fills the entire cyclic existence of desire, direction, and space with the resounding sound from the syllable whom, together with the light emitted from the mantra garland, Om Tare Tutare Turi Soa, at her heart. So this is a reference to the praise related to her. Desire refers to the desire realms that make up the five types of migrators or beings in samsara. So hell beings, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, and gods. Direction 
refers to the form realms, which are realms from the karma of strong concentration. And space refers to the formless realm, which is even higher than that. So not only does Tara fill the seven realms with the sound from the syllable whom and the light from the mantra garland, she also tramples on the seven worlds with her holy feet to control effortlessly all the beings in these realms. So the idea of trampling feels kind of violent. It feels kind of like against Buddhahood, but what she's doing is she's subduing all of that that gives us harm, subdues all of that which gives us pain and subdues everything that makes us hurt ourselves and others. And then we have Tara victorious over the three worlds. There are names of worldly gods, um, Indra, Agni, Brahma, Banyu, Ishvara. You'll recognize these names from uh, the Hindu tradition. These are worldly gods, right? They're not fully enlightened beings. Um, they're sometimes called directional protectors and they can protect the four cardinal directions, protectors of the intermediate directions, protectors of above and below. For example, Indra is the worldly protector of the Eastern tradition. Agni, or the fire god, is the worldly protector of the southeastern direction. And you might recognize Agni from the fire puja practice. Agni is um, kind of our intermediary when we do fire pujas. Uh, Brahma is the worldly protector of above, and the wind god is the worldly protector of the northwestern direction. And then there's the Lord of Death, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these worldly protectors who haven't yet finished their path pay homage to and venerate Tara as they work towards their own enlightenment. So it's kind of saying that it's not just regular people like us who devote ourselves to Tara or who rely on her. Even those who have incredible qualities and incredible power turn to her as well. And then here's one of the more wrathful looking Taras. This is Tara destroying spells. She is seated, um, sitting with her right leg bent and her left leg outstretched. This symbolizes both method and wisdom. With her two legs, she suppresses all the black magic and curses that people have directed against you. And with the raging fire emanated from her holy body, she burns up black magic and curses till not even an atom remains. Her manner of sitting with her right leg bent and her left outstretched is a peaceful posture, but even though she is considered to be peaceful aspects, she's slightly wrathful and she's sitting within a whirl of fire. When we find that our body and mind are affected by some supernatural forces such as black magic or our house is tainted in some way, what we need to do is to visualize Tara in this slightly wrathful aspect sitting within a whirl of fire and pray to and request her to pacify all these harms. So notes on black magic, because you might go, huh, what? Um, the, the recommendation of most Tibetan teachers is if you feel like there is some sort of interfering forces in your life, in your body, in your house, don't get superstitious. Don't get weird. Don't give it energy. It might be the case that there are beings who are interfering. It might be the case that there's someone in your life who actively wishes you harm and actively is sending some suits your way, maybe even in a ritualistic form, but it's rare. <laughs> it's rare. And even if it happens, it's better to not give it too much energy. Yeah, it's much better to just do something like calling on Tara, do some Tara praises, and then set it aside and let it go. Because the more energy you give it, the more karmic connection you create with whatever negative being or negative person or negative practice is coming towards you. And you just really don't want to strengthen that connection. Yeah, especially while you're an ordinary person without the skill set to be able to bring them in towards positive actions and bring them in towards the Dharma. You have enough of a connection with them, it's fine. You can come back and get them once your qualities are better. You know, so you think, okay, demons, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. I'll help you out when I'm further along my path and I have more skills. <laughs> but it can, be, it can get really superstitious really easily. Okay, and we all have a tendency towards superstition. And it's something that can make us cringe as people who have studied science and people who have lived in the world. But still, if there's a ladder out, do you go under it? Sometimes you go under it just to prove that you're not superstitious, but we still kind of go around, right? 
like we have all million types of superstitions. And the advice here is acknowledge that there are some things that are beyond our comprehension. Acknowledge that there are beings in this realm that we cannot see. Acknowledge that sometimes those beings have ill will. Acknowledge that, but the best antidote and the best protection is compassion for them. Yeah, because all of these beings with sentience also have Buddha nature. There's no such thing as a fundamentally evil being. There are beings who have strongly habituated themselves to negativity. There are human beings, probably in our life, who have strongly habituated themselves to negativity. So much so they seem like they're evil because their actions are evil. But even they have Buddha nature. Even they are not a lost cause. So you do what you can to kind of protect yourself and your space, but with a really kind of um, relaxed mind about it, and then let it go and don't give it too much energy. Okay, so there's a few of these Taras that help with that. It's nice that they help with that, but don't get too fixated on it. And then there's Tara destroying demons and enemies, but here we're talking about Maras. Yeah, the Mara of the afflictions, the Mara of the aggregates, the Mara of death, the Mara of Devaputra or the son of the gods, meaning wrong views. So these four Maras, the worst and most difficult to subdue is the Mara of the afflictions. Because the afflictions, our negative emotions, are the causes of all of our suffering. The difficult people are just conditions, right? So when we look at all the different kinds of negative emotions we have, the root of all these negative emotions is the self-grasping con conception together with our self-cherishing. Those are the demons, the twin demons, self-cherishing and self-grasping. Those are the real demons. All the other afflictions such as pride, anger, jealousy, and so forth arise under the power of the self-grasping conception and self-cherishing. So the, when we see demons and enemies, we're talking about these inner obstacles that can be removed. We're not talking about going to war with anything external. And then we have Tara of the Rosewood Forest. So um, there's a visualization related to her that you can do. You can think that the Tara we are visualizing is inseparable from one's own root guru since Tara is inseparable from one's own root guru then. The holy body of one's root guru is inseparable from Tara and is also the Sangha jewel. The holy speech of one's root guru is inseparable from Tara and also is the Dharma jewel. And the holy mind of one's own root guru is inseparable from Tara and is also the Buddha jewel. So that's a nice way of thinking. So you can reflect on how one's own root guru is the embodiment of the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and how one's own root guru is in the embodiment of all the enlightened activities of all the Buddhas. And then Tara dispelling all sorrow. This is a very good one um, for depression, for anxiety, for grief. So we are praising this aspect of Tara who has this radiant crown ornament and is said to be very joyful and magnificent. This aspect of Tara is able to fulfill the wishes and generate joy in all those who possess faith in her. For those who do not possess such faith, she is able to overwhelm them with her splendid crown ornament, almost like enlightened charisma. Yeah, Her laughter that has the sound of the mantra to Tara is able to subdue Shiva, the lord of the desire realm, and his entire entourage. The main cause of receiving all the benefits from and the blessings of Tara is to have faith in her. When we have faith in Tara, we can, she can fulfill all our wishes. And this also pleases her holy mind. So side note about faith in the Buddhist tradition is we have many types of faith. The weakest is blind faith. Yeah, that's the weakest faith. It's, um, it functions, it does the trick until it's challenged. What we want is faith based in reason. We want a faith of conviction. So how do we develop a logic based faith in relation to something that is intangible? So what you want to do is to think about the parts of the Dharma that are straightforward, logical and provable. Like through developing patience and loving kindness, you can subdue anger. 
You can prove that to yourself by practicing the practices of the patient section of the Lam Rim Chenmo. Doing those practices repeatedly, your anger will be less, your antidotes will be quicker. You can prove that to yourself within one life, within a few weeks. You can see how those reasonings and that repetition works. So you take examples of things that are very provable to give you conviction that the one who taught this is not lying. That the one who taught this understands the human condition. And so if he taught this, which is provable, and this, which is logical, but I haven't proven yet, then this, which is a bit more mystical and magical, I'm going to be open to. I'm not going to force myself to believe anything, but I'm just going to be open to, let's see what happens. Yeah, let's see what happens if I kind of practice in this way and just have an open mind. And then what happens is experience starts to reinforce the proof. So you have some faith based in conviction and logic, some faith based in experiences and connections that you've made through practice. Yeah, and you just, you know, you keep it kind of open and just, let's see, let's see. But really what you're doing is proving to yourself that the Buddha is a valid being and looking at the things that really do resonate for you and then gently building trust that the things that you can't prove as quickly are true as well. That makes sense. So faith in that sense. Yeah, not forced. And then Tara eliminating destitution. This one is very much about kind of helping unlock wealth karma and abundance and, you know, feeling like you're really rich with resources to practice the Dharma as well as long life. So you visualize that from the syllable whom at her heart, and I know normally Tara has a tam, but some of them have whom as their seed syllables. That's a long story. So you visualize this Tara has a whom at her heart, light rays and the aspect of hooks go out in the 10 directions, hooking and summoning back all the good things, such as longevity, wealth, possessions, and so forth. Then these dissolve back into the whom at her heart, and blessings in the form of light rays and nectar enter you. You should also visualize other sentient beings experiencing this, especially those who are undergoing financial difficulties and problems, um, particularly family members who, who you have strong karma with who are struggling financially. And so while receiving the blessings, think that you're receiving longevity, wealth, possessions, and so forth. So miserliness is the cause for us to experience poverty. At the same time, think that all the obstacles, such as miserliness and its imprints, are completely purified. And then you think that now you're like an inexhaustible treasure. And you think like this, all the negative karma that causes us to be poor is purified. When those karmas are purified, all good things will come. So it's not an invitation to look down on poor people. It's saying that we all have created the causes for poverty and they get ripened by any number of conditions. Let's try and prevent that because with abundance and with support and resources at our level, it's easier to practice. Someday practicing with almost nothing, we will still feel abundance and we will have enough to get on with. But at our level, we need secure housing, we need secure food, we need the basic needs met. And so connecting with her in order to reinforce those. And then we have Tara creating auspiciousness. Her crown is adorned with a crescent moon, likened to the moon on the first day of the lunar calendar when we do the puja. She is wearing ornaments exceedingly bright. The white light rays from her ornaments eliminate all suffering of sentient beings. Tara's hair is very black and shining and is tied up into a hair knot. The Lord of the lineage Amitabha is seated on her crown. From Amitabha, light rays of different colors emanate to perform the work of sentient beings. Tara and Amitabha Buddha are inseparable from our own root guru. So radiating light. Um, And just, you know, the note on colors, when we say um, the Taras that are white, you never think Caucasian, right? You think white, like white, like the moon. You know, when we say yellow, we're not referencing any race. We're referencing yellow, like yellow, like the sun. Okay, so um, nothing about the deities is referencing human colors. We're talking about deity colors. 
So here's another one of the more wrathful ones. And you see she's got a halo of flames and she's got kind of a growly expression. Tara, the destroyer of the opponent forces. Because sometimes we need a very assertive aspect when enacting compassion. Sometimes we need very direct, very clear, fiery words and speech and actions that are completely motivated by love, completely motivated by compassion. So you're not wanting to dominate sentient beings, you're wanting to dominate afflictions. So it's an important distinction when you see wrathful aspects. So she's able to destroy the whole host of outer and inner enemies by turning the wheel of Dharma. The inner enemy refers to our negative emotions. The outer enemy includes both human and non-humans and the problems and obstacles that arise as a result. So just remembering that about wrath, that it looks fierce, it looks like anger, but it is never motivated by anger. And then here's another wrathful one. So if we're harmed by non-human beings such as Nagas or spirits, we rely on this wrathful aspect and make requests to her. So we visualize that from the blue syllable whom on both her palms and the soles of her feet, fire and vajras are emanated and enter into us and those who are harming us. When we receive these blessings, all the negative emotions, especially the thought of harming others in our mind and in the minds of those beings harming us are completely pacified and purified. So from the soles of her feet and the palms of her hands, you think fire and vajras are em emanated and they settle our mind, they settle the mind of the harm givers. And then both our minds and the minds of those who are harming us become very pure and clear. Not even a single thought of harming others remains. If we do this practice when we are experiencing such harm, it can be very beneficial. By praising Tara with reference to both her peaceful and wrathful aspects, we've completed the whole section on praising Tara with reference to her Simbhogakaya aspect, so her enjoyment body. And now we go into praising Tara with reference to her Dharmakaya aspect, her wisdom body. Okay, so then we have the Tara of serenity and peace. So she is happy. The words in quotes are a reference to the prayer that you'll see in the next session. She's happy because no one, she has no suffering, right? <laughs> she is virtuous because she does not accumulate the causes of suffering, i.e. non-virtue. She is peaceful because she does not have any more afflictions, the objects of abandonment in her holy mind. And she's passed beyond sorrow, a state that is characterized by the complete abandonment of the two obscurations. And she's always in meditative equipoise within the sphere of peace. And then Tara, the destroyer of attachment. So in the prayer, it will say, with the 10 syllables, she destroys attachment. This refers to the mantra of Tara. So there's both a peaceful mantra and a wrathful mantra. We've been doing the peaceful one. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha that surrounds the syllable Tom at her heart. The wrathful mantra is Om Nama Tare Namo Hare Hum Hare Soha and surrounds the syllable Hum at the heart. And so this one is really only to use if you're feeling very grounded in your compassion, very grounded in your renunciation, but you need added strength in the appearance of your behaviors and the support that you're asking for. Generally, the peaceful one is plenty. So in either case, light rays emanate from the mantra garlands of both peaceful and wrathful mantras and liberate us from all enemies and obstacles. There we go. It's accomplisher of all bliss. Um, so here we're making prostrations and paying homage to Tara, who possesses the power to shake the three worlds. The text says causes Mount Meru, Mandara, and Vindhya mountains to shake and tremble. These are different mountains that are the abodes of different Nagas, gods, and so forth. So we are prostrating to this wrathful Tara who possesses the power to shake these very powerful mountains. And so these different kinds of mountains, why does she shake them? She does this by rendering them powerless and harmless. Okay, so all of this is in the Geshe Lama Lundrup commentary, which is free on Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. But again and again, when you're seeing these wrathful activities, it's one of these things where very, very rarely do you yourself take on that aspect? 
sometimes you can ask for and want support from a much stronger aspect, a much more fiery aspect. But for us, our anger is so close to the surface. It's very hard for us to show a powerful aspect without anger being activated. Yeah. So, I mean, by all means, be assertive, be direct, have clear communication, stand up for yourself. But wrath in terms of an appearance of anger with the actual motivation of love is a very delicate dance that most people can't do for very long without it going defaulting back into anger. Okay. So pacifying and eliminating poisons and sicknesses this one is very good for the pandemic that we're going through right now. It's also very good if you are, you know, bitten by a snake, bitten by a spider, of course, go to the doctor, <laughs> go to the doctor. But um, she's particularly good for helping with poisons and sicknesses. So we may be poisoned by others, or we may accidentally ingest some poisons like food poisoning or something like that. So what you do is you visualize the aspect of Tara in the space in front of you. And you visualize she's holding a moon that looks like a mirror in her hand and showing this to yourself and all other sentient beings as she utters the mantra Om Tare to Tare Pei. Visualize that you receive the blessings and that all the poisons, both external and internal, such as the mental poison of the negative emotions, are completely pacified for oneself and others. And then Tara, eliminator of disputes and bad dreams. So this is your classic with human conflict. Yeah, disasters at work, disasters with the family. Do this practice before you have a hard conversation. Do this practice before bed if you've been having some really bad dreams. Okay, so the visualization is Tara in the space in front and now red light rays. The red light rays and nectar coming into you and pacifying all nightmares, bad dreams, whatever problems you're experiencing, such as disputes, quarrels, lawsuits, and so forth. And you think that it's all cleared. And then eliminating plagues. The two eyes refer to, she has both peaceful and wrathful aspects in this one. From the wrathful aspect, the two eyes are likened to the blazing sun. When the eyes are in wrathful aspects, the eyes are big, red, and round, and the light radiating from them is hot. From the peaceful aspect, the two eyes are likened to a round moon. When the eyes are in this peaceful aspect, the light radiating from them is cool. So it's saying really whatever you need, but again, eliminating plagues comes in handy this day and age. And then here's the last one. So here you visualize Om, Ah, whom, and you just think about meditating on three places, very similar to the sadhana we've been doing, and you think it destroys all hosts of evil spirits, corpses, yakshas, all of these things that are kind of stealing our vitality, our radiance, our vibrancy, and by relying on Tara, these different kinds of harms will be completely destroyed. Okay, so when you do the Tara praises, you're doing all of them. You're connecting with all of them, whether you remember what they're for or not, just by saying their names and their praises, you're connecting with and reinforcing those karmic connections. Okay, so here they all are. And again, when you do the visualization, you start with home homage to the venerable Arya Tara, meaning the center one. And then they go in order around like this, starting with red one, two, three, four, and up and over, and down, and across. So here's some recommended readings. So here are those two free ones. So you can take a screenshot or write them down. The one I've been using just now is this commentary on the praises to the 21 Taras by Lama Lundrup. And then there's this other one by Geshe Dawa, which is excellent. So those two are available free, and I really recommend them. Okay. So these are the ones for people without the empowerment. Um, some of them are very contemporary and modern, and some of them are more traditional. The one that I really recommend is How to Free Your Mind, The Practice of Tara the Liberator by Tupton Children. This is the one I really recommend. The other ones are good. Um, they're less specific in some places, 
This one by Bokar Rinpoche is interesting. They're good, but anyway, this is the one I really recommend, How to Free Your Mind. For those of you with the empowerment of Chittamani Tara, the highest yoga tantra form, or are planning to have the highest yoga tantra form at some point, these three. So this has a very unfortunate name, The Cult of Tara. That sounds terrible. But um, anyway, it's a very old book. Um, it's one of the ones that we relied on before we had more, but it actually has really good stuff in there. And, and these ones all talk about how to do the retreat, how to do the Tara Puja, a lot of the layers of things. So if you're thinking of doing the highest yoga tantra form, these are the ones. So we can send you a book list later, but just so you know, those resources are out there. All right. Okay. So um, we're going to have a little break and then we'll do Tara Puja. Okay. 15 minutes. 15. Okay. And then our last session.